If trouble comes in threes, then what'll be the next global market to melt down after the U.S. and Europe? Some are looking nervously at China. China has been nothing short of a financial miracle. In just 30 years, this state-controlled economy became the world's second largest, deftly managed by government policies and decrees. One sector the authorities concentrated on was real estate and construction. But that may have created the largest housing bubble in human history. If you go to China, it's easy to see why there's all the talk of a bubble. We discovered that the most populated nation on Earth is building houses, districts, and cities with no one in them. The story will continue in a moment. So this is Zhengzhou, and we are on the major highway, or the major road, and it's rush hour, and yeah. it's almost empty. Gillam Tullock is a Hong Kong-based financial analyst who was one of the first to draw attention to the housing bubble in China. He's showing us around the new eastern district of Zhengzhou in one of the most populated provinces in China. Not that you'd know it. We found what they call a ghost city of new towers with no residents, desolate condos and vacant subdivisions, uninhabited for miles and miles and miles and miles of empty apartments. Why are they empty? I, I've heard that they have actually been sold. They've all been sold. They've, They've all been all sold. They've all been sold. Absolutely. They're owned. Owned by people in China's emerging middle class who now have enough money to invest but few ways to do it. They're not allowed to invest abroad. Banks offer paltry returns, and the stock market is a roller coaster. But 15 years ago, the government changed its policy and allowed people to buy their own homes, and the floodgates opened. So what they do is they invest in property because property prices have always gone up by more than inflation. And so they believe it'll always go up. Yeah, just like they believed in the US. Actually, property values have doubled, tripled, and more. So people in the middle class have sunk every last penny into buying five, even ten apartments, fueling a building bonanza unprecedented in human history. No nation has ever built so much, so fast. How important is real estate to the Chinese economy? Is it central? Yes, it's the main driver of growth and has been for the last few years. Some estimates have it as high as 20 or 30 percent of the whole economy. But they're not just building housing. They're building cities. Yes, that's Giant right. Giant yeah. cities being built with people not coming to live here. Yes, I think they're building somewhere between 12 and 24 new cities every single year. Unlike our market-driven economy, in China, it's the government that has spent some $2 trillion to get these cities built as a way of keeping the economy growing. The assumption is if you build it, they'll come. But no one's coming. This is really completely, totally empty, and it goes up. Gillum took us to this shopping mall that's been standing vacant for three years. Can I find this all over China? Yes, you can. They've simply built too much infrastructure too quickly. But I see KFC behind you. Yep. I see Starbucks over there. I see some other very recognizable American franchises coming in here. Yep. At least they, does that mean they have faith that, that this is going to ignite? No, these are all fake signs. This is to give potential buyers the they're, impression of what it might look like if they moved in. They're not real. So KFC didn't they buy haven't. this space or rent this space? No, they haven't. Starbucks? No. They just put the sign up? That's right. It's all make-believe, non-existent supply for non-existent demand. Look at that. Swarovski, Piaget, they're yeah. hoping for high-end, too. H&M, Zara. <laughs> and it's all Potemkin. Yeah. It's surreal, and it's everywhere, like the city of Ordos in Mongolia, built for a million people who didn't show up. And no, you're not in England. You're in Thamestown, a development near Shanghai built like an English village. And it was finished, I think, around five or six years ago. And it must have cost uh, close to a billion US dollars. And you'll see it's still standing there empty. Well, I've heard that there is some industry there, or some business, one business there. Marriage. Wedding pictures, <laughs> yeah. is that right? 
And what's more uplifting than a wedding or 10? You can see these empty developments on the edge of almost every city in China. What about the idea that China is urbanizing? People are flooding into cities, or want to anyway, from the rural areas, by the hundreds of millions. Yeah. And that this really is a smart move, build a housing, to accommodate the urbanization process. Well, so people are being moved into the cities, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they can afford these apartments, which, you know, cost 100,000 US dollars or whatever. I mean, these are poor people moving into the cities, so they're building the wrong sort of apartments. And what's worse, to build all these massive cities, they've had to tear down what was there before, clearing rice fields and displacing, by some counts, tens of millions of villagers. On the edge of Zhangzhou, Gillam and I came upon a strange sight. I'm just watching what they're doing. Do you have any idea? I think they're trying to recycle the bricks. These villagers are salvaging what's left of their homes, bulldozed to make room for more empty condos, already encroaching in the distance. There are all these empty apartments over here. Can they conceivably move into those upscale places? Most people in China live in about or less than two dollars a day and these apartments probably cost upwards of 50 or 60 thousand US dollars so it's very unlikely. What will happen to them do you think? They'll be forced to relocate somewhere. I have no idea where they'll go. These are the immediate casualties of the building boom and there's another problem. Analysts warn that all this building has created a bubble that could burst. So if the bubble bursts who's left holding the bag? There are multiple classes of people that are going to get wiped out by this. Um, people who have invested three generations worth of savings, so grandparents, parents and children into properties, will see their savings evaporate. And then of course there's 50 million construction workers who are working on all these projects around China. The prognosis of a bubble about to burst isn't only coming from financial gloom and doomers. We heard it from the most unlikely source. Are you the biggest home builder in the world? Yes, I think uh, maybe. That you I'm, may be. Yes, I'm only the quantity, not quality. Wang is that, is modest, that, that. but his company, Vanki, is a $53 billion real estate empire building more homes than anyone in China. He was born on the front lines of communism and joined the Red Army, but he secretly read forbidden books about capitalism, so that when China liberalized its economy, he rushed to the front lines of the free market. Even he thinks today's situation is out of control. Are homes in China too expensive today? No. Here, mm -hmm. Here's a number that I saw. A typical apartment in Shanghai uh -huh. cost about 45 times the average resident's annual salary. Even higher. Even what does higher. that mean Maybe. for your economy if, if, if it's just too expensive for the vast majority of people to So buy. I think that uh, uh, dangerous. Dangerous. That's the um, bubble. So I think that's the problem. Is there a bubble? Uh, yes, of course. There is a bubble. Yes. And the issue and is, is, will it burst or not? Yes. That's the big yes. issue. If there's a bubble, that's uh, that a disaster. If it burst. If it burst, that's a disaster. To try and prevent the disaster, the Chinese government decided to act. Heard of their one-child policy? Since 2011, China has had what amounts to a one-apartment policy, where it's very hard to buy more than one apartment in major cities. Because of this, prices plunged. The bubble was being tamed. And yet, the taming was creating all kinds of unintended consequences. Are many developers in debt? So, yes. And are many stopping development in the middle of projects because uh -huh. they don't have the money to go forward. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. That, uh, that's a huge problem. A problem because the slowing down of construction led to a downturn in the overall economy. Unfinished projects dot China and not just apartment buildings. Look at this. Can you believe it? Analyst Ann Stevenson Yang, who has traveled across China, showed us a giant project all but abandoned in the port city of Tianjin with concrete skeletons as far as the eye can see. The plan is to build a new financial district to rival Manhattan, including a Lincoln Center and a World Trade Center, only taller. 
but it all seems frozen. But there's supposed to be a Rockefeller Center here. I hope they have a Christmas tree too. <laughs> Skating rink. City officials told us everything stopped because developers want to build all the facades at once to match. But on the ground, we heard a different explanation. Workers told us that many of these buildings haven't had any work done on them for weeks, months, as if the developers just don't have the money to go on. It's true. You see that happen first, that migrant workers will go home. That's often the first sign that the debt crisis is starting. The debt crisis. Well, when you stop the paying your bills, then are... everything stops. It could become a debt crisis because of the huge loans most of the developers took out. If they can't repay them, the whole economy will seize up. The government's great fear is that all this could lead to social unrest. And that's not hypothetical. Last year, when home prices fell, it infuriated all those owners of multiple dwellings who watched the value of their nest eggs plummet. And there's already been some demonstrations yes. over real estate yes. around the country. Yeah. Have you had demonstrations against your showrooms anywhere, your company? Often. So often, Wang sure shudders to think what would happen if the bubble actually burst. If that uh, bubble broken, that may be, who knows what will happen. Maybe that, <laughs> maybe, I answer, maybe next the Arabic Spring. Arabic, Arabic Spring. Yeah. You mean people coming out and demonstrating? Mm -hmm. A lot of economists say that it's too big for even this government to control. Uh -huh. I believe that top leaders uh, have the enough uh, smart <laughs> to deal with that. You think you're, you're praying they do. <laughs> you're going like that. I hope. But that's uncertain. Meanwhile, people who can afford it are still buying as much real estate as they can. They're even finding ways around the one apartment restriction in big cities. Can't buy in Beijing? Just cross the city line and the boom is in full swing. Flyers advertising new projects, potential buyers crowding buses to see new construction. And new owners line up to register their new apartments. Like us in our bubble, they just don't believe the good times will ever end. American companies are feeling the impact this morning of China's move to weaken its currency. China devalued the yuan for the second straight day. Initial move Monday sent stocks tumbling in the United States. The Dow closed down 212 points Tuesday. That is a decline of more than 1%. Shares of Apple dropped by more than 5%. Let's get to the serious stuff, shall we? The markets. China lowers the value of the yuan again. Down go stocks. Some financial experts are calling it an act of war, a currency war to be exact. Think about it. China needs to up its exports to improve its sagging economy. So by making its currency less valuable compared to other global currencies, China can make products manufactured in other parts of the world effectively more expensive and harder to export. That's the simple part, but there's much more to it than that, and that's why the world economy is reacting with such great concern today. The slide has begun with their economy. Their slide has begun. Yes. Convinced of this. I'm, I'm because back. If, if you're right, that's bad news for our market. Because yeah. if they're sliding there even more, our market comes down even more. China has rattled the global economy. The 2% devaluation of the yuan has already pushed the U.S. dollar higher. And right away, U.S. stock indices dropped more than 1%. Global equity markets also fell sharply. Oil sank even further. It also raised fears about a new currency war as other nations devalue simply to compete with China. And there are political implications. Donald Trump says China's surprise move is going to have a huge impact. They're just destroying us. Our currency is going up, which sounds good, but actually, if you look at what it's doing to our country, and they're cutting their currency, they keep devaluing their currency until they get it right. They, they're doing a big cut in the yuan, and that's going to, it's going to be devastating for us. According to the Wall Street Journal, the most immediate effect is that it signals to the world that Beijing thinks the Chinese economy is sputtering. 
The move suggests China is looking for ways to get it going again, but it also has major implications for the U.S. and other countries that trade with China because it puts their companies at a disadvantage. If they don't know how to deal with it, when do they really crash? When does that happen? We're talking, I think, maybe months. You know, you have, for months, instance, months. Um, the head of a, a capital research firm in Beijing saying sometime this year is going to be the final end of the Chinese economy. You really see the American dollar collapsing. Absolutely. I mean, it's propped up based on hope, based on hype, based on speculation. We have an enormous trade deficit, you know, with China. Obviously, the Chinese economy is better than ours. They produce all the things that we can't produce. All the goods that Americans want to consume, they're made in China. We don't make anything the Chinese want to consume. I mean, I guess some motion pictures and music, but that's about it. Did the Chinese just kill a rate hike here in the United States by showing its weak hand of cards? And will it move overnight? Will that spark a currency war with China? And what will it mean for U.S. investors? You know, all the real products are manufactured over there. Their economy is far more powerful, far more dynamic than the American economy. That's why we have these big deficits. But people believe in the myth of this U.S. economy. They believe that this bubble is genuine. They made the same mistake in the late 1990s. They made the same mistake, you know, before the financial crisis of 2008. They're making a mistake again. We are on the verge of a much worse financial crisis than the one we went through in 2008. And it's going to take the form of a currency crisis. You're talking about currency wars. America is going to win the currency war, which is a race to the bottom. Right. And you don't want to win a currency war because a currency war is different from most wars in that the object is to kill yourself. And unfortunately, we're going to succeed. China's move to devalue its currency sparking today's sell-off, reviving concerns that the second largest economy is beginning a tailspin. And mindful of that, internationally, does that mean the yuan replaces the dollar as uh, the international base currency? We've got about a minute left. It very well may. Who knows? I mean, I think the Chinese are accumulating a lot of gold. I think they're, you know, being very quiet about how much gold they're buying. In fact, I think they're deliberately misrepresenting uh, how much their gold holdings have increased. They are taking advantage of the weakness, recent weakness in the price of gold to buy more. And by the way, the gold was up today. Not only was it up big in terms of the yuan, but it rose in terms of the dollar as well. Get out of the dollar before the bottom drops out. All right, Peter Schiff. The president or a politician or group that even understands what they're doing, they feel that Obama is either not watching the ship, incompetent. What it means is they're going to take more jobs and more money out of the United States. It's a simple. Moving on, the Islamic State has made a sensational claim in its propaganda magazine. The terror group says it can use the billions of dollars it has in its coffers to acquire a nuclear weapon from Pakistan for carrying out an attack on the United States of America. The ISIS has claimed it can buy a nuclear weapon from Pakistan within a year. The ISIS has claimed that it has the capabilities a terror attack to use a nuclear weapon. The Islamic State claims it has billions of dollars in a bank and they can then use their friends in Pakistan to purchase a nuclear device through weapon dealers with links to officials in the region. I want to bring in Deputy Editor Strategic Affairs Shiv Arur for more on this. Shiv, what do intelligence agencies make of this claim? Yeah, this is a threat that concerns the entire world because we're talking about a nuclear device here. High security Pakistani uh, installations have been, uh, you know, have been held hostage by, you know, by terrorist outfits which are not very advanced. Uh, you know, 60 uh, Terry K. Taliban Pakistan operatives uh, held uh, the, 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 the Marine Naval Base a few years ago. Other high security establishments have been, you know, have been taken over or inv invaded or infiltrated in the past by, yes. uh, you know, Lashkar -e Taiba and other uh, terrorist organizations. So the fact that Pakistan cannot keep its high value, sensitive strategic installations safe, uh, you know, its secret materials safe is something that yes. the world has been concerned and nervous about for many Many, many years. In order for you to understand how I can say these things, let me give you my personal story. 
Many years ago, by the providence of God, I was actually invited to be the chaplain to the elite of the world. And for three years' time, I lived with the people that most people only hear about. Uh, you, you never get to rub shoulders with them or to meet them. I literally, physically lived with them for three years, became quite close friends with a number of these individuals, and have kept in touch with them over the past 38 years. Because of this, from time to time, they have told me what is planned. Keep in mind, nothing ever happens by chance. Everything happens by design plan. They know, sometimes years in advance, what they intend to do. Definitely, nothing happens just planned by yesterday. So, with this in mind, you can understand why you may hear different things from different people, whether it be your favorite talk show host, your favorite author, whoever it may be, may vary slightly to some of the things I'm going to say because very few of those individuals have personal contact, could pick up the telephone and actually call one of these individuals and say, will you tell me this information? The things the elite have told me that they have planned for September through December of 2015. If they have their way, this is what will take place. Now keep in mind, they don't always get their way. Their way may be interfered by God. Their way may be interfered by something that takes place in government or foreign affairs. It's unexpected. But if they have their way, these are the things they have planned September through December of 2015. Number one, and this is positive as positive can be, there positively will be a worldwide financial collapse. I hope you caught those words as I said them. Not a collapse just in the United States of America, not just Canada. Now, you must watch a number of things. Please, educate yourself on the word derivatives. Right now, the derivative market has literally gone crazy. It, it, it is beyond all imagination. The derivative market is estimated, and nobody really knows what it is. They know it could be more than this even. It has been estimated to be at least one quadrillion. That's correct. At least one quadrillion. You could take all of the assets of the entire world, all the gold, all the silver, all the companies, all the nations, all the Federal Reserves. You could take everything in the world and combine it, and you would not equal one quadrillion. The derivative market is a glorified Las Vegas gambling den for the bankers of the world. There's no control on it. There's no law to prohibit it. And because banks cannot earn money on interest today as they did years ago, they have only one place that they can keep their doors open. That's either you as the depositors or to play the derivative market. And every major bank in America and the world plays the derivative market. And the collapse will be brought about by the elite using the derivative market to do it because the day that the derivative market collapses, every currency and every bank in the world will collapse at the same time. There may be a lag point of a few days between one and the other. It may begin in Europe, as I've been led to believe, and spread to other countries, third world countries, and then into America. And when no one is able to come to the rescue of the third world countries because they, the collateral is not there any longer to back them up, it'll bring down eventually both the Chinese, the Japanese, and the American currency. The derivative market will be used to do it. Derivative market is uh, one of the major factors of the derivative market is interest rates. Derivatives cannot stand a rise in interest. It must rise at some point. It cannot continue to stay at zero or below zero. It must go up. They all know that. And when the elite are ready, all they have to do is begin to raise interest rates, and eventually it'll get to the point where the derivative market will collapse. They could do it any day that they want to do it, and they could, they could do it worldwide 
immediately. Watch derivatives. Interest controls the derivative market and you'll also notice that debt is a big factor of the derivative market. Every nation in the world you could basically say is in debt. America, if you could take all the debt of the world and combine it, America has more debt than that. We are not only bankrupt, we have been bankrupt. It's just the fact that we haven't been declared bankrupt yet. Somehow the American people still have some faith in that paper which is utterly worthless and if it's written on a piece of paper it's worth the paper it's written on. The first thing that will happen September through December a worldwide financial collapse will take place if the elite have their way and it's fairly certain that they could do it at any point that they wish to. The second item <clears throat> that I have been told is positive. It will happen if the elite have their way during September through December. They've been planning this for years. You remember Daddy Bush, George Herbert W. Bush years ago. Uh, he said, New World Order. Now, they've been talking about it for a long time. They've been trying to decide when they're going to do it. Well, it's definite now. Uh, the New World Order is scheduled to be fully implemented between September and December of 2015. You will actually see this in video form in just a few moments. But for right now, let me just tell you that it is there. They're ready to do it. Everything is in order. They have all the players put together. They have dates set when certain people are going to appear before the United Nations in order to announce it. They have certain dates that have been set that a certain individual will, will speak to the Congress of the United States of America, and all of this is planned. Hi, I'm Ron Paul. I spent 22 years as a member of Congress. Now I live more than 1,000 miles from the nation's capital, but today I'm briefly back in Washington. I'm not here for political reasons, however. Instead, I'm here to deliver an important message to every American citizen, no matter what your political party affiliation. In short, I want to let you know that a U.S. financial crisis greater than the crisis of 2008 is fast approaching. You see, after so many years in Washington, I thought I was immune to being shocked by what our government does. But the actions of the Fed and the last two White House administrations have gone beyond anything I could have imagined. Most Americans don't realize that in the past six years, we have created $4 trillion of new money literally out of thin air. At the same time, since 2006, we have literally doubled our national debt. And I've said many times over the years, prosperity cannot be created out of thin air by a central bank. So please, as a citizen of this country, pay attention to what your government is doing right now. The people running our country today are living in a fantasy world. And if you're not careful, you could be the one who pays the price. Hardly anyone is talking to the American people honestly about what is going to happen in our country. So please, hear me out. The way you live, work, travel, retire, and invest in America, everything is going to change. Some of it in ways most people do not expect. And this one will be very different from the financial crisis of 2008. Because this time, it won't be just a banking and mortgage problem, but a full-blown currency crisis. This will happen because investors around the world are catching on to the fact that the U.S. dollar is not the safe haven it once was. As a result, we are almost certain to have a major stock market crash and a currency collapse too. This will make it nearly impossible for our government to spend more money than they have to expand the welfare state, to station our military in more than 140 countries. And when our currency collapses, nearly everything else will go with it. Stocks, bonds, commodities, you name it. When you destroy the currency, you can destroy the entire economy. You can destroy the whole nation. We're likely to see all kinds of new laws and rules about what you can do with your money, where you can put it, and where you can move it. 
They've been doing that since the 1970s. It's going to get worse, much worse. We're likely to have a massive inflation when the trillions and trillions of newly printed dollars begin making their way into the economy. This period is going to be particularly tough on seniors and anyone relying on fixed income or money from the government. We've also witnessed major changes to the very fabric of our society, as well as our personal liberties. Destroying a nation's money in this manner wrecks businesses, friendships, and families who simply don't understand and aren't prepared for what will happen. What our government is trying to do today has been tried many times before in dozens of places around the world. It almost always leads to disaster. I assure you, this gross experiment with our currency will soon lead to a real currency crisis right here in America, the likes of which we have never seen before. The question is not if, but when. The piling up of unfathomable debt and endless money printing is going to come to an end, and it's going to happen much sooner than most people think. For years, I've tried fighting the people behind these policies in Washington. I never voted for more debt. I tried to audit and even put an end to the Federal Reserve. I swore to uphold the Constitution. I took that oath seriously. But the truth is, no matter what's in the Constitution, Washington controls our money and they have put us on a course for certain financial crises. Shortly after 9-11, the CIA launched Project Prophecy. Its mission was to detect imminent threats to the United States from terrorists, hostile nations, and from weaknesses lurking inside our economy. On August 7, 2006, Prophecy System uncovered warning signs of an impending terrorist attack. Three days later in London, a plot to blow up 10 U.S. passenger jets was thwarted, and 24 Pakistani extremists were arrested. In 2007, Prophecy spotted a fast-approaching crash in our real estate and stock markets. Intelligence community officials presented their findings to the Treasury, who ignored the warnings. What happened next was the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. In recent years, prophecy has been used by the Pentagon to ready our defenses in the event of an economic weapon of mass destruction being detonated in our financial markets. Unfortunately, the architect of the CIA's Project Prophecy has now come forward to warn the public that America is about to suffer a $100 trillion collapse. In the following interview, he reveals why this outcome is unavoidable. Viewer discretion is advised. My name is Steve Myers, and I want to thank you for taking part in this exclusive Monday morning interview with Jim Rickards, the financial threat and asymmetric warfare advisor for both the Pentagon and CIA. Recently, all 16 branches of our intelligence community have come together to release a shocking briefing that contained an alarming consensus. These agencies that include the CIA, FBI, Army and Navy, they've already begun to estimate the impact of the fall of the dollar as the global reserve currency and our reign as the world's leading superpower being annihilated in a way equivalent to the end of the British Empire post-World War II. And the end game could be a nightmarish scenario where the world falls into an extended period of global anarchy. Jim Rickards fears he and his colleagues' warnings are being ignored by our political leaders and the Federal Reserve. And we're on the verge of entering the darkest economic period in our nation's history, one that will ignite a 25-year Great Depression. Today we're going to examine everything he's uncovered, because the bedlam could begin within the next six months which is why every American should hear his warnings before it's too late. Jim Rickards, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure, Steve. Glad to be with you. In the early 80s, you were a member of the team that helped negotiate an end to the Iran hostage crisis. In the late 90s, when it was discovered that the Wall Street firm Long-Term Capital Management was about to cause a total collapse of the financial markets, the Federal Reserve had to turn to you in order to stop this catastrophe from plunging America into a recession. And then, after 9-11, you were tasked by the CIA with investigating potential insider trading that took place prior to the terrorist attacks. That's exactly right. The problem was the CIA didn't have any capital markets expertise, and why should they? Uh, prior to uh, the, you know, the beginning of globalization, capital markets weren't really part of the battle space. So the CIA engaged in some outreach. Uh, they recruited certain people, myself included, to bring the Wall Street expertise 
to the agency. This led to something called Project Prophecy. So what the CIA said, well, if there's going to be another spectacular attack, using price signals to determine the actions of participants in the market, whether it be terrorists or strategic rivals of the United States, could you spot it? Could you get the information and actually break up the plot and save American lives? This system you built with Project Prophecy actually predicted a terrorist attack that was thwarted in 2006. On August 7, 2006, I got an email from my partner. Uh, she said, Jim, we got a bright red signal on American Airlines. So she said, looks like a possible terrorist attack. We documented that. I was up at 2 o'clock in the morning in my study watching CNN, and all of a sudden, MI5 and New Scotland Yard emerged to break up this terrorist attack. They were arresting suspects, uh, removing files. So this showed that the system worked. Uh, it's not just good for predicting terrorist attacks, but also strategic attacks by rivals and enemies of the United States. For years now, you've been helping the Pentagon and CIA prepare for a rise in asymmetric warfare and financial threats. Because today there are immense fears will be struck by, as you've described it before, a financial Pearl Harbor. There's now concern in different branches of the U.S. government. Historically in Washington, the Treasury and the Fed take care of the dollar. The Pentagon and the intelligence community take care of other threats. But what happens when the dollar is the threat? The Americans generally know that the Fed has increased the money supply by $3.1 trillion. We have $17.5 trillion of debt. We have $127 trillion of unfunded liabilities. What are those? Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, student loans, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA. You go through the whole list and it goes on and on and on. There's no way to pay it. During the boom years of the 1950s and 1960s, every dollar of debt that was created, we got $2.41 worth of economic growth. So that was pretty good bang for the buck. But by the stagflation of the late 1970s, that had actually collapsed. So now for a dollar of debt in the late 1970s, we were only getting 41 cents of growth. So obviously that's a huge drop off. You know what that number is today? Today, we only get three cents of growth for every dollar of debt. So we're piling on the debt, but we're getting less and less growth. As that trend goes from $2.41 to $0.41 cents to $0.03, cents, it's soon going to go negative. This is a signal of a complex system about to collapse. This really speaks to what you wrote about in your new book, The Death of Money. The title strongly alludes to this. The hourglass is now empty. You warn we're about to fall into a 25-year Great Depression that the stock market could plunge almost overnight 70%. You know, when I use the phrase 25-year depression, it sounds a little extreme, but historically it's not. Uh, we had a 30-year depression in the United States from about 1870 to 1900. Economists actually call it the Long Depression. That was before the Great Depression. The Great Depression lasted from 1929 to 1940, so that was quite long. The U.S. is in a depression today. A lot of folks might disagree with you that we're currently in a depression. That word brings to mind images of the 1930s and soup kitchens. Well, we have soup kitchens today. They're just at Whole Foods in your local supermarket because 50 million Americans are on food stamps. It's not that we don't have distress. We have enormous distress, but it's being hidden in different ways. The unemployment rate today is actually 23% when you calculate it the right way. And you point the finger right at the Fed, Congress, the White House. I actually was in a meeting in the Treasury, and I said to the audience, uh, the Fed and the Treasury are the greatest threat to national security, not uh, al-Qaeda, not some of the other threats out there, but right here in this building with this group, uh, you people are destroying the dollar, and it's just a matter of time before it collapses. And I testified before the United States Senate about this. I warned the Senate, you know, maybe we can't stop earthquakes on the San Andreas Fault, but nobody thinks it's a good idea to send the Army Corps of Engineers out there and make the San Andreas fault bigger. But by money printing and credit creation and reckless monetary policy by the Fed, we're making the San Andreas fault bigger every day. And when you make a complex system bigger, the risk doesn't go up a little bit, it goes up exponentially. So the risk is unimaginable at this time. The collapse hasn't happened yet, but the forces are building up, and that's just about to snap. Your take, and that of many in the intelligence community, is much different than what we're hearing out of Capitol Hill, which is why the allegations you make in this book are causing quite a controversy in Washington. I was actually at a recent conclave uh, in the Rocky Mountains with a couple central bankers, one from the uh, Federal Reserve and one from the Bank of England. They'll say things privately that they won't say publicly, and I was handed a copy of Janet Yellen's playbook. The Fed is trying to kind of use propaganda, lie to us about economic prospects, talk about green shoots, use happy talk to try to get us to spend our money. The Fed doesn't know what they're doing. Don't ever think that they know what they're doing. You can print all the money you want, but if people are not borrowing it, if they're not spending it, then your economy is collapsing, even with the money printing. So you can understand it this way. So let's say I go out to dinner and I tip the waiter 
and the waiter takes my tip and he takes the taxi cab home and the taxi driver takes the fare and puts some gas in her taxi cab. Well, in that example, my dollar had velocity of three. One dollar supported three dollars of goods and services, the tip, the taxi ride, and the gasoline. But what if I don't feel great and I stay home and watch television and I don't spend any money? Well, that money now has velocity of zero. I leave my money in the bank, but I don't spend it. Let's look at what's actually happening with the velocity of money. It's plunging. Uh, it's going down very rapidly. But compare this decline in velocity today to what we saw leading up to the Great Depression. Now, in the depths of the Great Depression, velocity was even lower. But if you compare what's going on today to what happened in the late 1920s, just prior to the Great Depression, there's a very striking resemblance. So it doesn't matter how much money the Fed prints. The Fed is trying desperately to bend the curve. Think of it as an airplane that's coming in for a nosedive. It's crashing, crashing, getting close to the ground. The Fed's trying to grab the joystick and pull the plane up out of the nosedive and get it back in the air. But unfortunately, it's not working. We're heading for a crash. We've just covered a lot of these startling numbers, these signals of this coming Great Depression. Let me see if I can quickly put it all together. Nobody denies that we have a debt crisis in this country. But you're saying we can no longer grow our debt without causing our economy to aggressively slow down. We're barely above water now. So that's signal number one. Signal number two is this dangerous slowdown in our velocity of money. It's already plummeting the levels not witnessed since the Great Depression in the 1930s. Are there any other signals the intelligence community is monitoring that suggest this collapse is right around the corner? There are, Steve. There are a lot of signals out there, and they're very, very troubling. Uh, one of the ones uh, I'm watching closely, and I know people in the intelligence community focus on also because it, it covers so much ground, is called the misery index. The misery index is when you take the unemployment rate and you take the inflation rate and add them together and then just sort of chart that. You look at the misery index today compared to the period of stagflation in the late 1970s and early 80s that Americans remember so well, it's actually worse. This can lead to social instability. Take this back to the Great Depression. The misery index in the Great Depression was at 27, but today it's at 32.89. Believe it or not, it's worse today than it was during the Great Depression. What happens as the Depression worsens? Businesses can't pay their debts. The bad losses fall on the banks. The banks ultimately fail. That's happened before. The Fed's there to bail out the banks. What happens when the Fed itself is in jeopardy? Based on these signals you've been tracking, the Federal Reserve is going to fail? The Federal Reserve actually in some ways already has failed. I spoke to a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, and I said, you know, I think the Fed's insolvent on a mark-to-market basis. And this governor first resisted, said, no, we're not. Uh, But I pressed her a little bit harder, and she said, well, maybe. And then I just looked at her, and she said, well, we are, but it doesn't matter. In other words, here's a governor of the Federal Reserve admitting to me privately that the Federal Reserve is insolvent, but said, you know, it doesn't matter because central banks don't need capital. Well, I'm going to suggest that central banks do need capital. Look at this chart. What it shows you is that the Fed has increased its capital. Uh, It's currently about $56 billion. That sounds good. You say, gee, $56 billion is a lot of money. That's a pretty good capital base. But that's not the whole story. You have to compare the capital to the balance sheet. How much in the way of assets and liabilities is that amount of capital supporting? When you look at that, it's a much scarier picture because the actual liabilities or debt, if you will, in the Fed's books are $4.3 trillion. So you've got $4.3 trillion sitting on this little skinny capital base of $56 billion. That's very unstable. Prior to 2008, the leverage was about 22 to 1, meaning they had $22 of debt on their books for every $1 of capital. Today, that leverage is 77 to 1. So yes, the capital has increased, but the debt and the liabilities have increased much more. Your warnings haven't gone completely ignored. In the budget he presented this year, Senator Rand Paul cited your work and how we've driven our economy to the edge of a Roman Empire-like collapse. In fact, We have footage of Senator Paul instructing Americans to listen to your warnings. Jim Rickards, author of Currency Wars, notes, the Fed is insolvent on a mark-to-market basis. The Fed has wiped out its capital on a mark-to-market basis. Of course, the Fed carries these notes on its balance sheet at cost and does not mark them down to market. But if they did they would be broke. First of all, I give Senator Rand Paul a lot of credit. He's one of the people who understands the dangers here. But the problem is not limited to the Fed. It's infecting the private banking system as well. There's about $60 trillion of debt on the balance sheets of our banking system. For a long time, debt in the banks grew at about two times the rate of growth in the economy. But lately, this has exploded. 
Today, it's up to 30 to 1. In other words, for every dollar of economic growth, there's $30 of credit being created by the banking system. The whole thing's unstable. I can give you a very good example of this, and this actually comes from physics. If you had, let's say, a 35-pound block of uranium shaped like a cube, it would actually be fairly harmless. It's what we call subcritical. It's radioactive, but it's kind of tame. But now imagine you engineer it. You take that 35-pound block, you take one piece and shape it into something about the size of a grapefruit. Take another piece, shape it into something like a bat. Put the ball and the bat in the tube and fire them together with high explosives. That sets off a nuclear detonation. That destroys a city. The way it's been shaped and configured is what takes it from what we call subcritical to supercritical. Jim, are you seeing any signs that our stock market has reached a supercritical state? Well, unfortunately, yes. We're seeing a lot of signs of this. One of the ones that's really fundamental and really important is the ratio of stock market capitalization to GDP. Because, you remember, this, the value of all the stocks in the stock market, that's supposed to represent the fundamental economy. It's not supposed to be off in a world of its own. But if you look at what's been happening to that ratio recently, it's going sky high. It's 203%. Prior to the recession, that number was 183%. Go back to the famous uh, tech bubble, the dot-com implosion of 2000. At that time, it was 204%. And if you want the scariest news of all, just prior to the Great Depression, that number was 87%. In other words, the stock market capitalization as a percentage of GDP is twice as high as it was just prior to the Great Depression. So that's a really good metric for saying, hey, is the stock market heading for a crash? All the data says, yes, we are. But there's another metric, another warning sign, if you will, that's even more frightening, which is the gross notional value of derivatives. There's a certain number of shares of IBM that are outstanding, but we know what that number is. But there's no limit on the derivatives. I can write options and futures on IBM stock all day long and all the other stocks on the stock market. And that's what's been going on. Now, the gross notional value of derivatives in the world today is over $700 trillion dollars, not billion, 700 trillion. That's 10 times global GDP. This collapse is unavoidable. So, you know, we ask ourselves, how bad can this be? Well, what happened in 2007, 2008, when the markets collapsed, we all remember the value of stocks going down, uh, real estate going down, housing going down, all that lost wealth was $60 trillion. The problem is now the system is bigger. So I would expect the lost wealth this time to be a hundred trillion dollars, possibly a lot more. We're in this critical state, getting close to the super critical state where the system implodes. But it takes a catalyst. It takes a flashpoint. There are a number of potential flashpoints I've investigated. Jim, in a few moments, I want to discuss the steps Americans need to take with their investments and personal finances to prepare for everything you and your colleagues are predicting. But now let's quickly focus on some of these major flashpoints. One of the key flashpoints we're looking at is foreign ownership of U.S. government debt. Now, this is a very important thing to understand. We all know that the Treasury has issued over $17 trillion worth of debt. The question is, who buys it? A lot of U.S. debt is owned by foreigners. Who owns it? China, Russia, other countries, countries that are not necessarily our friends, but they can dump it when they want to. Well, guess what? That's actually what's been going on. Recently, foreign holdings of U.S. government debt have been plummeting. But it gets even more interesting than that. We talked earlier about the project I did for the CIA, Project Prophecy, and we said you can see not only market action, but rivals, enemies, terrorists, and others operating in financial markets. So we all know that Russia invaded Crimea in the spring of 2014, and Crimea is now effectively part of Russia. So let's say you're Putin. You know you're going to invade Crimea. You know you want to take over eastern Ukraine you can expect U.S. financial sanctions. So what do you do? You basically mitigate the impact of the sanctions. Start dumping treasuries in advance so that when you make your move and the treasury tries to come against you, you've insulated yourself. So now you go back and look at October. Here's Russia dumping treasuries month after month. That was a clear signal that they were getting ready to do something to engage in financial warfare against the United States. Guess what? It's worse than that. We know the Russians and Chinese are working together. So is it any surprise that when the Russians started dumping, the Chinese started dumping also. Does the intelligence community have the ability to defend our country in the event that this escalates even further? Believe it or not, there's an intelligence unit inside the Treasury, and they actually have a war room. That tells you that financial warfare is here and it's real. So if the Russians are dumping, the Chinese are dumping, and the Fed's tapped out, Who's going to buy all this debt? Well, a mystery buyer has shown up. Recently, Belgium has bought enormous amounts in the hundreds of billions 
of dollars of U.S. government securities. So Belgium started loading up on treasuries, coincidentally, at the exact same time Russia and China began dumping theirs. It's not the Belgians. Uh, these amounts are bigger than the Belgian current account surplus. Uh, these are not Belgian dentists who are buying these things. Belgium is a front. You know, could it be the Fed itself? That's the point. Maybe the public doesn't know who the mystery buyer is, but the national security community does. Now, the Treasury operating through this war room and the Fed mystery buyer in Belgium, for now, have managed to prop up the Treasury market. It hasn't collapsed yet, but they're not going to be able to keep pulling these rabbits out of a hat. There's a limit. This should be very scary because if the Fed's tapped out, we talked earlier about how the Fed's leveraged 77 to 1. So the Fed's at the limit of what they can do. The foreigners are now dumping treasuries. And if no one buys, guess what? Interest rates go up. That'll sink the stock market. That'll sink the housing market. Higher interest rates mean the debt gets higher. So interest rates go up some more. So you start a death spiral and there's no way out of it. An attack on our treasury market is obviously a very serious flashpoint that could ignite this Great Depression you predict in your book. Let's talk about another flashpoint. What I call flashpoint number two has to do with the petrodollar. Can you explain what you mean by the petrodollar? It's basically a system whereby by oil exports are priced in dollars. Oil doesn't have to be priced in dollars. It could be priced in euros, Japanese yen, Swiss francs, gold. It could be priced in a lot of things. But in fact, the whole global oil market is priced in dollars. And I was actually very close to the birth of the petrodollar system. My first visit to the White House on official business was in 1974 with a small group, about five of us. We met with Helmut Sonnefeld, who was the deputy national security advisor at the time. He was the number two to Henry Kissinger. This was at a time, you know, you have to remember, at the beginning of the 70s, oil was $2 a barrel. At the end of the 70s, oil was $12 a barrel. So this was an oil shock. The price of oil was skyrocketing. Inflation was getting out of control. There were gas lines. You know, certainly a certain generation of Americans remember this very well. Well, we were in the White House talking about what to do about this. And one of the scenarios we discussed was the U.S. military would invade Saudi Arabia. We would secure the oil fields, create a military perimeter around the oil fields. We would pump the oil and set it at a price that was favorable to us. Now, we would give the money to the Saudis. We didn't want to steal their money. We didn't want to steal their oil. We just wanted to set the price. Now, fortunately, that plan was not carried out, but it shows you how desperate things were at the time. But what did happen? Why did we not invade Saudi Arabia? Well, the answer is Kissinger and the Saudis worked out a deal. And the Saudis said, okay, we'll price oil in dollars. So that secures the role of the dollar as the global reserve currency. But there was a quid pro quo. We agreed to guarantee the continuation of the House of Saud, the royal family of Saudi Arabia, and by extension, the national security of Saudi Arabia, because uh, they're a relatively weak military power, and, and it's a bad neighborhood, uh, a lot of enemies in the region, you know, starting with Iran and others. So a question would be, obviously, did this petrodollar deal work? And it absolutely did work. Once it kicked in, the dollar roared. This was the period, sometimes people call it the king dollar period, the strong dollar period. This was after Volcker and Reagan in the 1980s. But this only continued up to a certain period of time, up until you know, around 2000. And then since then, the dollar's been in a decline. So what could cause the fall of the petrodollar? Well, we're seeing it in real time. Think of the petrodollar or the dollar's role as a global reserve currency. Think of it as a three-legged stool. So here's the stool and it's got three legs. As long as the legs are standing, the foundation is firm, and the dollar will remain as a global reserve currency. But one by one, those legs are being pulled out. What are the legs? Well, the first one is Saudi Arabia. That was where the petrodollar deal began. Our side of the deal was we would guarantee the national security of Saudi Arabia. But lately, going back to December 2013, President Obama stabbed the Saudis in the back by anointing Iran as the regional hegemonic power. You know, the president has been withdrawing pe American power from around the world. And his view is, you know, well, we'll leave a friendly cop on the beat. Every sort of bad neighborhood around the world will have a cop on the beat. The president's decided that Iran is going to be the cop on the beat in the Middle East. They're going to be the heavyweight regional power. Where does that leave Saudi Arabia? Out in the cold. So now Saudi Arabia is saying, wait a second, you've undermined our national security. You've reneged on your side of the petrodollar deal. Why should we hold up our end? Maybe we'll start pricing oil in gold or euros or maybe Chinese yuan. Because now, increasingly, Saudi Arabia is selling more and more oil to China. So the first leg of the stool has been pulled out. The Saudis are going to back away from the petrodollar because we're no longer guaranteeing their security because we're playing footsie with Iran. Second leg of the stool is Russia. Now, Russia is not a member of OPEC, but they are the lo world's largest oil exporter, one of the world's largest energy exporters, uh, actually bigger than Saudi Arabia. 
So even though they're not a member of OPEC, they also price oil in dollars. Uh, so they've signed on to the petrodollar deal in their own way. But we're now engaged in financial warfare. Russia's ready to fight back. So this is not, you know, classified information. This is being said publicly. Andre Kostin, president and chairman of Russian Vinestorg Bank, VTB Bank, it's one of the largest banks in Russia, he recently said, it's time to change the entire international financial system that considers the dollar the key reserve currency. The world has changed. There's another member of the Russian parliament. He said, the dollar is evil. We will sell rubles to consumers of our oil and gas, and later we'll exchange the rubles for gold. If they don't like this, let them not do it. Let them freeze to death. So two of the legs of the stool, Saudi Arabia and Russia, have already been pulled out. The third leg is China, and that leg is coming out too. As far as Russia and China's role in taking down the petrodollar, this recent $400 billion energy alliance they signed, is that the purpose of it? Sure. Russia is the world's largest energy exporter. China is the fastest growing economy in the world. They need energy. So this is a natural partnership between the two. But the dollar is out in the cold. China is actually putting these yuan bilateral trade agreements in place all over the world. They're doing them one by one. But once there's enough trade and enough volume in certain currency, it can become a reserve currency. These are all straws in the wind leading to the collapse of the dollar as the global reserve currency. Jim, in your book, you investigate how nations are now using gold as a financial weapon. Is this one of the most dangerous flashpoints? It's absolutely one of the most dangerous flashpoints, and here's why. A lot of people look at the dollar and say, look, you may not like the dollar, you may worry about the dollar, but you've got nowhere else to go. But there is another place to go, which is gold. You don't have to buy treasuries, you can buy gold. And countries are actually doing that. So this is basically a global rebalancing of gold reserves. This is one of the things that the intelligence community is watching most closely, uh, and China's our number one case. Here's why. China has acquired more than 3,000 tons in the past four years. Now they lie about this. They officially say they have 1,054 tons. The reason is China is using their own military and their own intelligence assets to acquire some of this gold in stealth. I recently ran into a senior officer of one of the major secure logistics firms in the world. Secure logistics, that means these are people who operate vaults, and armored cars. So they handle the physical metal. They're not central banks. They're not government agencies. These are like you know, Brinks and G4S and Viamat. These are the big players in this field. One of these officials said he recently bought gold into China at the head of an armored column of the People's Liberation Army. In other words, he was in an armored car and had armored personnel vehicles bringing gold into China. I guarantee that did not show up in the official Hong Kong import figures. Now, why is China doing this? A lot of people speculate that they want to launch their own gold-backed reserve currencies, to take the Chinese yuan, back it with gold, make it a global reserve currency. That's extremely unlikely. That's not what China's doing. What they are trying to do is hedge against the collapse of the dollar. China can't prevent that from happening. What, what they can do is build up the gold reserves. This is known to the intelligence community. This is not publicly revealed. What if it were publicly revealed? Here's what global gold reserves would look like if the amount that China owns were actually suddenly revealed. This is a dagger aimed at the heart of the dollar. Jim, so far all of these flashpoints have involved China. Isn't this an economic suicide mission to attack America? There's something else here, another flashpoint that could melt down the global financial system. What if the U.S. doesn't bring the entire pyramid crashing down? What if it's China? Well, it could very well be. They have a highly leveraged banking system. But the banking system is just the beginning. There's also something called a shadow banking system. This is now a $7.5 trillion industry, and it's up 4,067% since 2005. This term shadow banking, it's starting to get play in the press. How would you explain it? If you put your money in the bank in China, they, it's just like the United States. They pay you nothing, you know, zero or maybe, you know, one quarter, one percent, something pathetically small. But they're offering these wealth management products that pay five, six, seven percent. Well, what are they? Well, they're actually, they take the money and they buy mortgages on worthless assets, inflated assets and bubble assets are going to crash. Before the crash in the United States, before 2008, new construction as a percentage of GDP growth, that was about 16%. 16% is a pretty big slug. But look at China. In each of the last three years, construction has been 50% of GDP growth. They're building white elephants, they're building trophy projects, they're building ghost cities. I've been to China. I was with the Communist Party officials and provincial officials. They were trying to get me to bring some businesses in. But I went to one place near Nanjing. They weren't building seven buildings, they were building seven cities. Every city had a whole cluster of skyscrapers, luxury hotels, 
athletic facilities, housing facilities, high-end shopping, metro stops, highway access, and an airport to service all seven of these cities. This construction was going on as far as the eye can see. It was all empty, all of it. Now, here's the point. In the U.S. before the crash, it took about 4.3 years of income to buy the typical house. In China, it takes 18 years of income. Well, if they're building apartments and co-ops and condos and people can't afford them, you know the price is going to collapse. One of the senior banking officials in China said, this is a Ponzi scheme. Those are his words, not my words. I happen to agree. But we all know what happens to Ponzi schemes. Eventually, you run out of suckers and they collapse. Once you have enough collapses, there's going to be a run on the bank. The bankers are going to say, sorry, we can't pay you. It's not our problem. Well, that's not going to be good enough. Riots are going to break out. What does it mean when the world's second largest economy hits the brakes? That's going to be disastrous for global growth. It's going to pull the rug out from under the sky high valuations we're seeing in U.S. stock markets. This is a setup for entire collapse of the global economy. Jim, there's one more flashpoint I'd like to talk about. It has to do with a premeditated plan you believe exists inside the IMF and involves high-ranking U.S. officials to replace the dollar as the world's reserve currency. It's not just my belief. This is actually documented. It's a 10-year plan to replace the dollar as the global reserve currency. The IMF released a report this year. It was called, get this title, The dollar reigns supreme by default. Here's a direct quote. The aggressive use of unconventional monetary policies by the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Central Bank, has increased the supply of dollars and created risks in the financial system. The dollar's status should be in peril. Reserve is nothing more than a savings account for a country. That's the amount of money they've saved. But the problem is when you have it, you have to decide what to do with it. You can't just stick it under a mattress, so to speak. A lot of people think that the dollar will prevail because there are no good alternatives. That's not true. The dollar is declining sharply as a percentage of all the reserves. Imagine if that continued. The euro comes up. Swiss franc comes up, some of the other currencies come up. That's one outcome, but there's another outcome that's probably coming a lot sooner, which is that we have a financial panic in the world and a central bank has to reliquify the world. Where's that money going to come from? It can't come from the Fed. And they're leveraged 77 to 1. There's only one clean balance sheet left in the world. That's the IMF. The IMF, believe it or not, is only leveraged 3 to 1. When the next crisis comes, it's going to be bigger than the Fed. The only source of liquidity in the world is going to be the IMF. Think of it this way. The Federal Reserve is a printing press. They can print dollars. The European Central Bank has a printing press. They can print euros. Well, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has a printing press also. They can print something called the Special Drawing Right, or the SDR for short. These SDRs can come along as a new reserve currency. The reason they came up with the name Special Drawing Rights is because if they called it world money, that would sound a little spooky and scary, but that's exactly what it is. But here's the point. This may be a 10-year plan. We're not going to make it 10 years. This this collapse will happen a lot sooner than that. So they're going to have to dust off this playbook and run out these SDRs and print trillions of them to prop up the system. Now, if the Fed bailed out private credit in 2008 and the IMF now bails out the Fed, in the next financial panic, who runs the IMF? Who's really in charge? Well, it's a nice crowd. You've got kings, dictators, communists. They're unelected, unaccountable. And this is the next flashpoint, really, the IMF taking over the world monetary system, becoming the central bank of the world, printing world money called the SDR. Jim, these flashpoints, the attacks on our treasury market and petrodollar, China's stealth gold run, China's inevitable collapse, even this alarming inside job to take down our dollar that's escalating at the IMF. You've only scratched the surface of what you reveal in your book. But really the most important message I took away from reading The Death of Money is that regardless of which flashpoint unleashes the 25-year Great Depression, folks need to understand it's coming and coming quick. Steve, that's exactly right. There is a mission in this book, and it's urgent, and it's important. We're talking about a prolonged depression. We're talking about massive deflation, massive unemployment, rampant bank collapses, a 70% best-case scenario stock market drop. This could all start within the next six months. We're in the last days of this financial system in the U.S. This is Zimbabwe. This ship is going down. This is the USSR in 1989. Now, however, he is making his latest, most dire prediction. He is calling for a major disruptive event in not only the markets, but possibly in politics, the money system, and your way of life. All to come, possibly as soon as September 15th, 2015. 
It is a pleasure to have back on with us world-famous adventurer, entrepreneur, investor, and writer, Jeff Berwick. This may be our most important show yet, so let's get right into this, as you're not going to want to miss what Jeff Berwick has to say today. And, uh, Jeff, you've never been shy about telling people your opinions, but your latest pronouncement may be your boldest yet. <laughs> yeah, it is, but I really think now is the time to be bold. I found that most people don't know about this information, and I think it needs to be shown the light of day. I guess I should start by saying that I've never made such an exact short-term prediction, but when people see the evidence I've uncovered, they'll understand why I believe a massive event could happen as early as this September. Give us some background on how you came to this conclusion. Well, it started out quite simply. In 2010, I stated that the US dollar would collapse within the next decade. To me, the path was quite clear. You just look at the total debt of the US government, now at $18 trillion, and its growth, and you can see where this is headed. And when you look further, you can see that even with a monstrous $18 trillion debt, it was only a small part of the story as so much of the debt and liabilities of the US aren't properly accounted for. Today, the amount of debt and liabilities of the US government is over $95 trillion. That's $300,000 per person in the U.S., or $1.2 million in federal government debt and liabilities for every family of four. I'm sure you remember the Great Recession, or the financial crisis of 2008. It was very bad. And even George Soros was quoted on it as saying, We witnessed the collapse of the financial system in 2008. And all they've done, and all they're still doing, is print money to act like it didn't die. But the proof is in the numbers. In 2008, the Federal Reserve announced something they had never done before. They called it quantitative easing. But what it really is, is printing never before seen amounts of money. That money's been sloshing around and has mostly ended up in places like the stock market, which even as we speak, continues to hit all time highs. At some point though, this money printing game has to stop and the rest of the world knows this is a certainty. And in response, countries around the world have begun to move away from the dollar. China's begun their own bank transfer system, which is the first international payment system to compete with the US dollar-based SWIFT system. There's a worldwide move away from the dollar. They're trying to rush it out to be completed by, of all dates, September 2015. Russia as well has been purchasing gold at record levels, and trade agreements around the world are for the first time in decades being done outside of the US dollar. For this and many other reasons, I've been expecting a collapse in the dollar. It's baked in the cake, and I've been telling my subscribers to prepare for this since 2010. Back in 2010, I said that we probably had five and no more than ten years left before the collapse. We're now five years in, and I'm seeing the first signs of a major collapse coming this fall, and part of my reason for this has come with my discovery of the Shemitah. Right. This is the part I want to get into. I've heard you speak and write on it recently. It sounds fascinating. Take as long as you want here and just tell us more about the Shemitah. Sure. Regarding Shemitah, I want to state for the record that my discovery of it has emerged as part of my financial analysis. The Shemitah has religious connotation, but that's not my focus. The point is that there are evidence-based ramifications to Shemitah, and from a practical standpoint, that's what I wish to investigate and address. I'm just looking at the facts of what appears to be happening around September of this year, and that just happens to be the end of the Shemitah year. Whether this is a coincidence or not remains to be seen. And I should also say that I don't necessarily think this September will be the end crisis of all crises. It could be just the beginning of a process that unfolds that takes many years to end in total collapse. But that said, I first heard of the Shemitah after reading Jonathan Kahn's book, The Harbinger. That book mostly talked about eerie events related to 9-11 and the Shemitah. While I found all the events related to 9-11 to be incredibly interesting, the thing that really got my interest was in what he said about the Shemitah. Now as background, the Shemitah is the Sabbath year, and it's the seventh year of the seven-year agricultural cycle mandated by the Torah for the land of Israel, and it's still observed in contemporary Judaism. To put it simply, every seven years is a Shemitah year. Because it is based on the Hebrew calendar, it doesn't fall on the same dates every year as our Western calendar, but it does follow quite closely. The Shemitah is also known as a time where all debts are settled, every seven years. It also can be interpreted as the washing away of things. 
But what caught my attention was that the last day of the Shemitah for the last two Shemitahs in 2001 and 2008 fell on days with a major market collapse. The last day of Shemitah in 2001 fell on September 17th, and that was the first day the U.S. stock markets opened after 9-11. That day had the greatest one-day stock market point crash in U.S. history up to that time. The Dow fell almost 700 points, or 7%, and it was a record that held for precisely seven years until the end of the next Shemitah year. That year was 2008. On September 29, 2008, the exact final day of the Shemitah, the Dow plummeted 777 points, which still today remains the greatest one-day stock market crash of all time. You may be noticing quite a few sevens in all of this. As well, on that day, it was the only known day on the New York Stock Exchange where the opening bell wouldn't ring. You're watching CNBC's Squawk on the Street, where the opening bell should have rung five seconds ago, but has not. I don't know whether we actually need the bell to start oh, trading. Hold on. There is a little bit of a consternation down here about there being no bell. All right. Our market reporters are, are standing by. Bob Pisani, have you ever seen anything like Nobel? Yeah, uh, that's a little strange here. But... I then decided to go back to Shemitah years since 1900, and I was very surprised at what I found. 1917 was a Shemitah year. 1917 marked the year that the U.S. entered into World War I, and soon after, the Russian, German, Austrian, and Turkish empires had collapsed. Remember, the Shemitah is a time of washing away. 1930, 1931 was a Shemitah year, and certainly wasn't a good time to be in the markets. From the beginning of the Shemitah year until the end of the Shemitah, the market dropped 50% from 200 to 100. And then after the final day of the Shemitah, the market dropped another 50% to below 50. Now, the next major Shemitah was in 1937 to 1938, and if you were in the market that year, you'd have lost nearly 50%. But, more importantly than the stock market during that Shemitah year, was what was going on in the world. During the Shemitah year in 1938, Germany began foreign aggression and seized Austria and Czechoslovakia. The world war that began in 1938 finally ended in September of 1945, nearly on the exact same day as the final day of the Shemitah. Countless empires and countries were left devastated by that date, again a washing away if you will. The next Shemitah was in 1973. In 1973, the Bretton Woods Worldwide Monetary System collapsed. The following Shemitah was in 1980, seen by most gold bugs and market historians as marking the end of the massively inflationary 1970s. Then the next Shemitah year ended in 1987. During that time, Black Monday occurred, the biggest one-day percentage drop in history on the Dow. That same week, the London stock market closed due to an extremely rare hurricane having hit London. Again, a sort of washing away. During the next Shemitah, the 1994 bond market massacre caused financial strife worldwide. And I've already mentioned the incredibly bizarre things that happened during the next two Shemitahs in 2001 and 2008. Of course, you can say that if you look for patterns, you can always find them in one way or another. And to an extent, that's true. But this Shemitah seven-year cycle is so eerily correct that it is well known on Wall Street as the seven-year cycle. For this reason, I've been keeping an eye on the end of the next Shemitah year on September 13th, 2015. And because of this, I began doing some research on what events may be happening in or around that time. And the amount of bizarre things scheduled for this coming September is what convinced me something is being planned for this fall. Yes. Everything you've covered so far is the past. Let's talk about the present and near future. Well, I, I decided to begin looking up the days on or around September 13th of this year to see if I could find any interesting events. And it didn't take long before I found numerous events all happening on or around that date of major significance. The first thing I found was that the United Nations opens its 70th session of the UN General Assembly on September 15th in New York City. World leaders from around the world will be attending. They call it their Jubilee Session. Now, I didn't mention this yet, but every seventh Shemitah, or in other words, every seventh seven-year period, or after every 49 years, is called the Jubilee Year, every 50 years. In the Jubilee, according to Jewish religion, it is the year when God, supposedly, gives back land taken away from their ancestors to them. Of note, in the last Jubilee, in 1967, 
Israel won the Seven Day War when Israel defeated Jordan and captured the West Bank, defeated Egypt and captured the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula, and defeated Syria and captured the Golan Heights. Looking even further back to the prior Jubilee year in 1918, the British Empire took back Jerusalem from the Turkish Ottoman Empire. And so in both prior Jubilee years, there was a major development in Israel. The next Jubilee year starts on September 14th of this year. As well, in September, the UN plans to launch a new plan for managing the entire globe called the Sustainable Development Summit from September 25th to 27th. Some of the biggest names on the planet, including Pope Francis, will be speaking at this summit. The focus of this plan is to expand the scope of global governance. Global governance can also be defined as one world government or a new world order. The Pope, interestingly enough, will be busy in the U.S. all of September, as on September 15th, the Pope will also be speaking at the U.N., and then on September 24th, he'll also be speaking at the U.S. Congress. The next thing I notice is that Jade Helm, a massive, unprecedented rollout of the U.S. military inside of the U.S., runs from July 15th until September 15th. This is particularly interesting in that there always seems to be a drill being run by the government during when an actual crisis occurs. Jade Helm has already begun in preparations, and the amount of military equipment being amassed in the U.S. is truly mind-boggling. There's a lot of speculation that this amount of military buildup in the American South is in preparation for some sort of civil unrest. That speculation built when a number of Walmart stores recently closed on the same day across the southern U.S. with no notice due to plumbing problems and are said to remain closed for six months. This fueled speculation that is to be used for some sort of detention center for unrest. They said they wouldn't reopen for six months, which just happens to be after September. But it gets stranger and stranger. Recently, the New York-based Federal Reserve announced it's moving its operations outside of New York to Chicago because of concerns about a natural disaster. One might ask, what natural disaster are they expecting in New York that they aren't expecting in Chicago? Then, after the Fed's recent Federal Open Market Committee meeting, it took the highly unusual act of removing all calendar references from its post-meeting statement. Normally, in the post-meeting statement, they include calendar events for upcoming important dates like the next meeting. This time, they didn't, and they just alluded that a date range for their long-awaited 0.25% rate hike, which alone can almost teeter the entire financial and monetary system loaded with debt, would likely be in the fall. But while they didn't put any dates of future meetings in their post-meeting notes, they do have dates on their website of upcoming meetings. According to their site, the next meeting will be held just after the Shemitah on September 16th and 17th. Meanwhile, the U.S. federal government is buying another 62 million rounds of ammunition commonly used in AR-15s for training purposes, and NORAD announced that it is moving back into the Cheyenne Mountains because it is EMP-hardened, leaving one to ask why NORAD is moving into the mountains to protect against a major attack at this time. It certainly appears as though a lot is happening all surrounding this September. Absolutely, and the list of strangeness goes on and on. There was the strange seven-minute speech by Christine Lagarde of the IMF talking about numerology and the number seven that she made in January of last year. She started the speech by saying, as you can tell, I do what I am told. And she went on to say, I want to test your numerology skills on the magic number seven. Most of you know that is quite a number. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, as you can tell, I, I do as I'm told. Numerology skills by asking you to think about the magic seven. Okay? Most of you will know that seven is quite a number in all sorts of themes, religions. That's a strange speech about numerology and the number seven coming from the managing director of the IMF. There was also French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius, who made a bizarre speech in 2014, stating that we are on the edge of a climactic abyss. We are, all of you know it, on the edge of a climatic abyss. In fact, we have 500 days to avoid a climate chaos. 
Out of curiosity, I added up the days from that speech, and 500 days from it lands on September 23rd, 2015. Yet no one questioned him why 500 days exactly. You can find many more examples like this. Everything seems to be gravitating towards this September. Something's going on. What that is, is anyone's guess. You want to take a guess? Uh, there's too many variables to make a solid guess, but this is far too many coincidences that all seem to point to something massive happening around September of this year. Also, there's Martin Armstrong, who was jailed for having a computer model that amazingly predicts the fall of currencies, markets, and even nations, predicted 20 years ago that there will be a massive system reset, collapse, or crisis on October 1st, 2015. If you listen to the actions of the Fed, they seem to be worried about some sort of natural disaster to happen in the New York area. If you listen to NATO, they appear to be preparing for an EMP attack. If you pay attention to the U.S. military, they are apparently preparing for a massive amount of unrest inside the U.S. And if you pay attention to the U.N., September seems to be a very busy month with leaders from around the world, including the Pope, attending numerous major events. In fact, we've already seen the first rumblings of a coming collapse happening in both Greece and China. The Shanghai stock market has already begun to collapse, falling more than 30% in the last two months, and the Chinese Nasdaq fell 40% in the last three weeks. And in Greece, the banks and stock market have been closed for weeks, and they're laying the foundation for a civil chaos that I expect to fully foment over the summer and explode in September. This will set off a chain reaction that will shake the entire U.S. dollar-based financial system. This is enough evidence for me not to be anywhere near the U.S. from now until at least October, and specifically in the month of September. This is just too much happening all at once for my comfort. I've also been advising for years to have no significant assets in U.S. dollars and certainly not in the U.S. bank, and I reiterate that more so now based on what I see happening in the coming months. If I'm totally wrong and nothing major happens during that period, then great. It's really not of any harm to prepare for some catastrophic event in the financial and political systems during that time because my advice for preparing for the end of the monetary system as we know it is the same for this September period as it has been for the last few years and still continues to be. I'm just getting more adamant on it now. I've been advising people to get out of the Western financial and monetary system, get into hard assets, keep cash, precious metals, food, water, and guns on hand to last for at least a number of months, and move yourself and your wealth outside of the U.S. if possible. I think there will be trouble all over the Western world, but the U.S. seems to be ground zero for this coming crisis. This is Jonathan Kahn, the author of The Harbinger and the Mystery of the Shemitah. We've been deluged with questions from around the nation, around the world, as to recent events and to what's coming. So we decided to make this, to address this in a very brief way. I believe a great shaking is coming to America and the world. I believe it will involve an economic collapse, a financial collapse, and a shaking even greater than those realms. Does it have to happen in this period coming at the climax of the Shemitah or autumn? It doesn't. I've given two cautions throughout. First, God is sovereign. He doesn't have to do anything according to our timetable or our thoughts. And our faith, I do not want it to rest in dates, but in God. And in getting right with God, that's the point. And the Shemitah is a pattern, a cycle. It can manifest more in one cycle, less in another. Nothing has to happen. It could be uneventful. The point is not dates. It's getting right in the will of God. At the same time, the other caution is it could happen according to this timing. And that's why I gave dates in the book, in the mystery of the Shemitah, that it's actually there that we should be aware of it. I believe regardless of the timing, whether during or beyond this time period, a great shaking is coming. What has happened since the Harbinger was released is America has not grown closer to God, it's grown farther. And the Harbingers have continued to manifest as America has continued on a course away from God. 
And what just recently happened is ominous. What happened a little while before recording this, earlier in the summer, is America took a step, it crossed the line. It struck down through the Supreme Court the biblical definition of marriage. This was a tectonic event, a seismic event, a culture-changing event with profound ramifications, not just for marriage, but for America's future itself, for culture, society, education, law, religious freedom, persecution, apostasy, and judgment. It altered what has been for thousands of years, the most basic component of human civilization. It's like altering the atom and not expecting a massive repercussion. It represents the breaking of nothing less than the order of God's creation. On the first day that America existed as a fully formed constituted nation, on the day of the first inauguration of a president, Washington gave a prophetic warning. He said, the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right that heaven itself has ordained. In other words, if America ever turns away from God, from disregards his eternal rules of order and right, then the blessings of God will be removed from the land. And if anything could constitute the disregarding of the eternal rules of order and right that heaven has ordained, it is the striking down of the biblical historic definition of marriage. And so it represents what happened, the the rejection of a nation of its Judeo-Christian foundation, of the word of God on which it was built, to become an officially post-Christian nation or an anti-Christian nation in its mainstream culture. And when, as the prophets cried out, when sin is enshrined or is viewed as good, then righteousness is viewed as evil. And so a warning has come of persecution, not just from the pulpits, but from the Supreme Court itself. Every one of the four dissenting judges issued a warning to the effect that believers, Christians in effect, will be persecuted. A change has come. And there is... There is an ominous message here. So the word Shemitah can mean the fall. In the Shemitah of 1973, there was a moral, spiritual fall when America decided to legalize the killing of its unborn children. And now in this Shemitah of 2015 has come another fall. One of the principles in scripture is that judgment is often preceded by an act of desecration. Ezekiel was in the temple, was shown by God the desecration of the holy place that was being committed there, and then he was shown of the judgment that was coming. Daniel was in Babylon, and in Babylon they had a feast, a party, a celebration to the gods. And the king of Babylon sent for the holy sacred vessels of God that were taken from the temple of Jerusalem to be brought out into the party and to be used as drinking vessels as they partied to the gods and as they did it a hand appeared on the wall and wrote words in Aramaic the so called the handwriting on the wall the words warned that judgment was coming and that night judgment came to Babylon desecration precedes judgment what happened this summer to take what is of God. Marriage is a vessel, a sacred vessel of God. To take it and use that vessel as the temple vessels were used against their purpose for another purpose and against the purposes of God and the word of God is an act of desecration. And that leads, it is to drink wine in Babylon from the sacred vessels of God. And that portends judgment. The nine harbingers that are mentioned in the book, The Harbinger, The signs of a nation heading for judgment have all been fulfilled, have actually continued to manifest as America has been racing to judgment in defiance of God. And all these things are converging. While America has descended from God with increasing acceleration, so at the same time, its relationship with Israel has deteriorated to to. Uh, levels it has never known. That is another danger sign because the Bible says, I will bless those who bless the children of Abraham. I will curse those who curse them. 
And on in every way, we are converging. It's like a perfect storm. Do I believe it is wise to be ready to prepare physically? I do. Not in fear, but in wisdom, and not in selfishness, but to bless others. But having a store of essentials to get you through when systems could break down, I believe is a wise thing anyway to have regardless of food, water, other essentials. If nothing happens, worst case scenario, no worst case scenario, you can eat your investment. We are not survivalists. We are revivalists. We are here to bless others and to be a light. But I believe it would be wise in this way. It says the wise man sees calamity coming and prepares. Financially, we've been asked, we've been deluged with questions. I wouldn't feel wise to be investing in the stock market unless the Lord told you or having things linked to the rising of the stock market. Rather, the most important preparation is to be right with God. If you're looking for safety in such times, the word for safety in Hebrew is Yeshua. And Yeshua is the name of Jesus. The safest place is to be in him. If you're not born again, if you're not saved, if you're not born again, if you're not born again, you're not going to heaven and you're not saved and you're not right with God, you need to get born again. Get your life into Yeshua, Jesus, that's salvation. And if you are and you're looking for what's the safest place to go, where should I live? Is it the Midwest? Is it the the coast? Where should I be? Well, I can tell you the safest place in America is called the will of God. Make sure your life is in the will of God. If there's whatever is in your life that shouldn't be there in your life, get it out of your life. Don't say tomorrow. Do it today. And whatever should be in your life that's not in your life now, the time is now, today, to start ruling it in. Take that first step. What happened this summer in the highest court of the land, it represents a change where the faith, the biblical faith, is going from a status quo faith to a radical faith, a cultural faith to a countercultural faith, a an establishment faith to a prophetic and revolutionary faith. And we have to become a prophetic people. The temptation is to be intimidated, to be pressured, to to go along with things or dance around them or to be silent, but we have to resist that. This is the time of our testing. We speak of the days of Elijah. Well, these are the days of Elijah when a civilization is turned against its very foundation in apostasy. These are the days of Ezekiel, same thing, the days of Jeremiah, the days of the apostles with an an increasingly anti-Christian world culture. You know, we preach about biblical times and we preach about living there or, hey, we would want to live in the book of Acts. Well, you've got them now. That time has arrived. These are the days of Elijah and we must become the Elijahs of the day. The most important thing you can do now is to make the decision that no matter what, you will follow God without compromise, without reservation, without wavering, all out on fire. The grays are disappearing. And as the grays disappear from the darkness, as the darkness removes the the gray to become totally dark, that means it's time for the lights of God to remove the gray from their lives and become totally bright for God. This is the time of our testing. We'll show where we are at. But this is the time that not only produces the greatest evil, it also produces the greatest good. These are the days that produce greatness. This is when the greatest testimonies come, when the greatest believers come. It will produce greatness in you because it's going to force you to make the decision, to make it for one or the other. And if you make it for God, you're going to grow stronger and stronger and stronger. Let this produce greatness in your life. Draw the line in the sand. People ask me, is there going to be judgment or revival? I answer that it can be both. There can be judgment or shaking and revival at the same time. In fact, revival can come out of shaking. And it may be that America has grown so deaf to the voice of God that only through shaking, only through his shouting, can revival come. But we need to be ready for that. We need to be praying for revival now, fervently. And not only praying for revival, we need to be actually living in revival. If, it, if you decide to live in revival in your own life with God, then the revival starts here and now. We need to be ready. It is time to be bold for God. If these are the days when the world grows darker, then it's time for the people of God to grow and shine brighter. If the bad is going from bad to worse, then it's time for the good to go from good 
to great. And those who do, if you will, God will especially anoint. It says, The eyes of the Lord search the entire earth, looking for the one whose heart is completely his. And he will show himself mightily, powerfully for that one. You be that one. You be that people. You be that congregation. You be that ministry. Shine for God. Be all out for God. And God will greatly, powerfully anoint you. This will be our most challenging time. But it can also be our greatest hour. Be great. Rise to the call. Rise to the mantle for which you were placed in this world, in your mother's womb for such a time as this. As the Lord said and says to you, Kumi ori kiva orech uchvod Adonai alayach sorach. Arise and shine, people of God. Arise and shine, man of God, woman of God, child of God. Arise and shine because your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Darkness covers the earth. Darkness will cover the peoples. But the Lord will shine and his glory will rise upon you. And nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your shining. Be strong and be of good courage. And may God bless and keep you now and always. Shalom.